welcome to our September development update. Hopefully all of you have been having a glorious month as we definitely have been, you know, at the grind getting a lot of things done and we're going to show off some of that right here. We have quite a few videos to share with you as well as, you know, our normal, you know, updates from all of our teams. But uh, just to kind of go over everything, if you haven't tuned in with us before, um, I'm Margaret Crone. I am our community marketing lead and I'm with our one and only Stephen Sharif, our creative director. How are you doing, Stephen? Hello. I am doing very good. It's been a, a busy morning. Uh, had some recording that we're going to show, just a little bit of recording a little later. Um, but the week's been great. Last night I had a really fun time with um, some of our colleagues and, and friends playing a, uh, a Star Wars little like uh, tabletop RPG campaign thing. So did you actually thing. fight the Death Star? Because it seems we, like that's we, what was happening. We did fight the Death Star, uh, but unfortunately... Um, Yavin 4 uh, suffered an unfortunate fate, and uh, I was the last one killed, though, to be fair. I was in okay. a B-Wing, uh, but I was the last one destroyed. But you know, so if, if, you don't, if you don't survive, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. My pilot actually Being last did survive. To die doesn't matter. The, ship, the ship was destroyed, but my pilot made it, so it was okay. Mm. Okay, well, your pilot survived? <laughs> Yeah, he survived. I got to nice. roll on the like, because I was in a home system or whatever. So there were like other little rebel like people trying to evacuate, and they picked me up on the way out of the system. Aww. Well, I'm sad that you didn't survive, but you know what? It's okay. <laughs> 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 but because you're surviving this, and this is what really matters yeah. in real life. Um, but yeah, we've been having a lot of fun uh, doing a lot of in, even other gaming with our with our fellow co-workers, especially now that we're all in the office. We're doing like a Magic the Gathering tournament. I know. Margaret's so been kicking fun. some butt. I have not. I've lost, oh, <laughs> I've really? lost all my rounds. You've lost all your rounds, too. <laughs> I know. We were playing some Magic tournament, Here's the too, thing, though. Right? Two of my matches, like, I was so close. One of them I would have probably won, actually, if I wasn't an idiot and read my well contract. they were all cheating with you anyways they were doing like free mulligans and you didn't get any free mulligans so you know yeah it's okay we'll yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll survive it's been fun though i've i've liked uh hanging out with people and you know playing games with everybody um and you know there are some other games that are on the horizon that we're making little guilds for that we're playing uh because you know some games are having updates and others are launching but you know we like playing games just as much as we like making them so let's talk about making Work them. hard play hard exactly let's talk about making games when we're not what we're doing when we're not you know hanging out and playing games so uh we're gonna go over some reminders we have some studio updates we have a design and engineering update a lot of videos from them with some cool stuff one of the things that i mentioned last stream we'll let you guys guess what that might have been that i was talking about last stream but we're actually going to show it here on the live stream um and then we have environment art and character art as well that we'll be doing and then we have some q a so you guys submitted some questions we're going to answer probably roughly 10, 10 of them but if we have extra time we may answer a few extra um but first and foremost let's go over some reminders first and foremost guess who's going to be starring on on a show Stephen Sharif, uh, we are oh. gonna. Stephen is going to be joining When's the that? discussion round, the Ashes of Creation discussion round, over on twitchtv giant, which you can go check out on September 26th, which is this Sunday at noon Pacific. So definitely go check that out. I think they have a um, on the oh, Reddit. You can submit Sunday. some questions still. So if you want to submit questions, pop on over. And put them over there, and uh, you know maybe Stephen will answer your question on the on the live stream. Next. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, and that's their hundredth episode, so it's a little bit of a fun celebration as well. Next up, we've got some cool things from our community. We just wanted to do like an extra shout out to you guys. Thank you so much for putting that lovely letter together. We really appreciate it. It was oh, that was awesome. It was so awesome, and the dev team the just team like, loved it. The team loved it. Um, and that's, that's the good, like heart and feely stuff that definitely is the biggest motivator for any developer to read from a community when, you know, you, you go through what is a lot of endless hours of work and putting together a milestone for the development, right? And you get to read the response from the community. And this was such, I mean, it was a very comprehensive, um, <laughs> Uh, it was very comprehensive. And the little doodles and stuff were so cute. Yes, cute. I love those. Those are great. Some of them were but, creatures from our game, too. I loved it. Yeah, that was pretty cool. 
It was very cool. Big hearts from the dev team to every one of you guys for for being such an awesome community and, and so supportive. And it, it really makes this process such an enjoyable and easy one to to pour your heart into because you have such an awesome community behind you. Yeah, I had happy tears. Um, and of course, we have our reminder that our cosmetics are going to be uh, swapping over the Coliseum's favored. We'll be swapping over on October 6th, uh, 2021 at 11 a.m. Pacific. And you can check those out over on our shop as well as on our news article that has some lore bits, which I'm sure all of our orc friends out there are interested in reading. Um, so snag it while it's hot because the next set's coming in. And I like the little snail. Yeah. That thing's so cute. Look at its little legs. People <laughs> are obsessed now. You know what? I got a lot of hate for the snail with legs. What? Now you all like it. You all are into it. Yeah, I like the little gimpy legs. They're cool. <laughs> and there's there's a reason they have legs, man. Guess what's in the water? If these snails are that big and they have long legs, guess what's in the water and why they evolved to have legs? That's the real question you should be asking yourself. Um, beyond that, we have, uh, I guess, um, some more dev discussions to chat with you guys about. And so with that, um, we asked you this month actually two questions for dev discussion. One was, how much time do you typically spend on character creation? And what are the tools you like to have available when you're building your character? Do you focus on race and class synergy looking good or something else entirely? And you all have sent some wonderful feedback for us. Uh, we've been compiling that as well as uh, you can continue to send us feedback. We'll keep looking over at anything new that's added in additions. So please feel free to do. I will say that there is some exciting stuff on the on the development front for the character creator. I sat through an hour and a half long uh, uh, dissertation uh, from my engineering team presented by Adam, Clayton, and Zach uh, on the endeavors and objectives for the, the character creator and the tech that's going to be created for it uh, and the tools for the for the character team. Um, and it it does look pretty good. I don't think I've seen when it, this was a common comment from the engineering team was, I don't think we've ever seen this elaborate of a character creator in an MMO before. So <laughs> I think it's going to be something pretty cool to share with the community when it's ready. Yeah. And like we've said in the past, if you're kind of new here and you don't know how that stuff is going to work, we are going to have the character creator be available before launch so people can kind of create their characters. Take your time. We understand that when it comes to like launching a product you on launch day, you want to be just as competitive as everyone else. So you don't want to spend the hour time creating your character. So we're going to give that to you a little earlier in advance so you can save your character and be able to like quickly utilize that template as you uh, make your character going forward when we launch. See, I know my engineers, by the way, are listening, especially those that presented in that uh, in the character creator meeting. Uh, so I've just set the bar high for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we still have some other ones. We had actually a bonus question for you all because the design team was having a discussion and they wanted this answer really quickly. So we kind of swapped it in and added it as a secondary quick one in here, which is, do you like to see larger variance in progression speed between different leveling activities, examples, questing, grinding mobs, or do you prefer a more homogenized pro uh, progression across different leveling activities? And how do you feel about progression speed generally? And you guys have been submitting tons of feedback on that. We really appreciate it. Um, and especially as that one was kind of like a quick toss in. Um, we do have some more uh, dev discussions coming up as per usual. We're still in development, so we still have a lot of things to ask you all. Um, so this next one is actually going to be about character inspection. Um, so <laughs> keep this in mind for your October thinking cap because we have a lot of um, things that we're working on for character Ooh. I think that was one that I had asked design mm -hmm. to send off to community yep. as like an emergency question to the community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we basically moved quick. the October one to November. We basically pushed everything down and moved this one to the October one nice. for you to get it in quickly. Um, but yes, sweet. your feedback gets used. So please, please, please submit it. Uh, we want to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, like we've said in the past, you know, a lot of the times when we get these re reports from your feedback, most of the time it aligns with everything that we are pretty much on the same page about. Um, but in other cases, sometimes you guys add a little bit of addition for us and we're like, oh, okay, we can see how we can integrate those, those things into our designs. 
Absolutely. Definitely go and participate in that in those discussions because the the commentary you leave as a community is the sword and shield in certain design discussions for designers on either side of an argument. So <laughs> it's nice to have player feedback and, and experiences being able to be leveraged in the design room when we discuss stuff. All right. And of course, we have even more. Um, as you know, this year we've added in a lot of guild gathering discussions because we are specifically focusing in on a lot of guild system stuff. Uh, you know, guilds are very important when it comes to MMORPGs. They're one of the reasons why people stay and, you know, pl keep playing the game. We make long lasting friendships. So definitely your feedback is important. This time we asked you if you had a phone app that integrated with your guild, what sorts of things would you want from it or think would be useful? And you guys have provided a lot of great uh, ideas, things that I think we we're already pretty much most of the stuff I saw on the list were things that we're already planning or thinking about doing. So keep uh, submitting feedback. If you have other additional ideas, definitely toss those over our way. And in October, we'll be chatting with you all about management tools, which I think are something that when I play a lot of MMORPGs, they're in some some games have good management tools, others don't, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to management tools. I don't think there's a game out there that's kind of doing everything that people need. I see a lot of people using like third party mm -hmm. or mod mods for that. All right. Yeah, um, as a uh, as a guild leader, like if I had an app that I could interface with, you know, to communicate with my excuse me, as a former guild leader, to communicate with my um, guild, I'd want the like ability to activate their speakerphone remotely without their permission. Like they give no, that permission. No, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying they give the permission what? when they join. I tell them this is a prerequisite for joining the guild. And then when they're not at a raid, I can just start screaming at them. Like I don't know, they're at dinner or something. I'm like, you need to get your butt back to the computer. We have a dragon to kill. You're supposed to be here an hour ago. Like that is, you know, what I think most guild leaders want. <laughs> I mean, kind of, yes. Because <laughs> when someone doesn't show up, you're like, and especially when they have an important role, like they're your main tank or one of your main healers, it is definitely stressful. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that if that was a feature allowed, like you gave permission to the app to do that, a lot of guilds would use something along those guilds lines. Guilds would want to. I don't think everyone would be okay with them doing that. Or just like forcibly activate the like um, uh, the video you know, the camera so that you can like see what they're doing. No, <laughs> I'm, just, Steven. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm no. just kidding. I'm just kidding on that one. He's trolling. Maybe a little bit. No, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Well, that might violate. Are, do some you rules. follow along those lines of what Steven wants? Or are you more interested in <laughs> not having that? I, I personally like my privacy. Um, I think that, you know, a calendar and notifications and pop ups are <laughs> enough for me. I don't need that much control. Um, maybe you are more the control freak than I am. I like how somebody said you act like Daddy Bezos isn't doing this already. <laughs> oh, That's no. true. I was like, they're already That's doing something true. with our phones. That's not true. We as a company do not endorse or believe that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. I mean, it's, I mean, it's true that like your phones pretty much record everything. All right. Let's move on to our next thing here, which is uh, content creator stuff. We are still continuing to take applications. So if you're interested and you are a content creator, uh, you know, the main thing for us here is consistency and quality of content. So apply to the program. We are not accepting anyone into the program quite yet uh, because we are still in our second round of interviews. I've been interviewing quite a few people, looking at a lot of resumes, uh, haven't quite found that perfect person for us. And like we said, you know, our main goal is to hire people that we really feel are perfect for our teams and, you know, are going to make uh, a solid, you know, intrepid family member that we have here uh, for long, for long lasting times. Um, and with that, once we do hire that person on, we will be bringing on our training program and sending out invites for folks. And then also if you aren't invited to the program or the training program, you will get an, a message anyway that, uh, telling you why, so that you can work on, you know, doing things to improve it so that you can be able to reapply at a later date. Um, but yes, that is that. The only other thing that I have for you all is web update stuff. If you've been keeping an eye on everything, we did have a small downtime during this month. It was specifically to fix some bugs. Those bugs have been resolved. It looks like everything is going smoothly. Uh, the primary one that people had concerns about were uh, folks who were in Europe who were having trouble purchasing, um, but hopefully that has been resolved for you. Um, 
We also are working on in the back end. I think I've talked a little bit about this last month, but there's because this is such a important back end thing. Um, it's going to take us a little bit more time to do, which is some more SSO integration and work on that end, as well as 2FA and more security, like general security things that we're trying to work on in order to make you know it better for you all. And of course, we are still working on support designs. They're kind of wrapping up that stuff. Um, they're working on the mobile version of the support page, and then um, we'll be moving forward with uh, the production process of that. But that is what's going on for our reminders. Next up, let's ha hand it over to Steven to talk about our studio updates. I feel like studio I had a lot updates. of reminders today. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of reminders. <laughs> Holy smokes. And we'll see you next month. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, a studio update. Things are going very good for at the studio. Uh, we have the last of our equipment and furniture, ancillary things being installed uh, as of next week. I think it arrives on Monday and should be installed by Friday of everything. We have about, I would say, 80% of the team is in the studio at this stage. Um, <clears throat> we've gotten some of the appliances in. We've had some great hires over the past uh, few weeks since our last... Um, stream, including uh, one that I guess got uh, picked up by um, a couple of news outlets. One of the uh, senior narrative designers for Intrepid is a gentleman by the name of Wynn McLaughlin. We're very happy to have him um, <clears throat> joining the studio. He was the former lead writer um, for Elder Scrolls Online, which I thought did a, a you know great job. I loved that game's <clears throat> narrative and stories. Um, I thought that was one of their strongest points. <clears throat> but also, he worked on you know Sotor and Tabula Rasa and other great games. He has a very distinguished <clears throat> background within the industry and is a, a very talented individual. So we're happy to to have him join the team. We also have some other uh, great individuals who've joined um, over the last month as well. So some of these key positions are getting filled. We've had really a lot of, again, you know, we kind of had this retrospective last month over Alpha 1. A lot of the different departments had opportunities to kind of speak and get into meetings and huddles about, you know, things that we've we've learned and that we <clears throat> have, you know, want to change from a practice standpoint, um, different development directions that we're taking. Uh, you know, I've been very heavily a part of daily you know, four or five hour long sessions with our design team every day of the week. <laughs> for day I'm of sure the it's week. been exhausting for it's everybody. <laughs> Those meetings are intense. It's like going yes. over everything. It's a lot of back and forth. It's yeah. And it then is, it's sometimes uh, a little bit of a battle of, you know, ideas. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I love personally. I, I, I like to, when I can sit back and just listen to the battle occur, you know what I mean? Because it is, I think it, it, there's a lot of, of, of valid ideas and, and, you know, changes that want to be implemented. Um, but it's good to have that opportunity to kind of after a big milestone like Alpha 1 to take the time, go through and actually evaluate what we learned, what we saw, the things we want to change, you know, what what came off from paper to, to practice and, and how that transition actually, you know, affected the systems and designs that we have. Um, <clears throat> so um, from that perspective, you know, everything everything's going pretty good right now. I think we're in a very nice place as a studio. Um, yeah, I, I also want to say yeah. that on the retrospective front, it was so nice. Um, one of the producers messaged me was like, dude, community team got a lot of love. And I think that I haven't worked at a lot of companies where people really appreciate the community team. So oh, it's yeah. been really nice to have a team of people who really understand like what we do on our end um, because, you know, it's it's a lot that we try to keep up with on the communication front back and forth between the players and the developers in order for them just to focus on their work um, so that we can get all the Absolutely. answers to you guys too. Um, and, you know, if there's ever anything that you think we need to improve, you, you guys know how to find me. I'm Margaret Crone. Message me. I'll, I'll, I'll make some changes. Um, so, yeah, a lot of love. It's been awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So moving on to design. Ooh, we got a lot of cool stuff here. I think you wanted to show off a video of you kind of showing some mounts first. Do you want to sure. do a little professional? Yeah, I'll do just a just a quick introduction to the video. Obviously, it's a short video. Um, you know, we over the past several months showed lots of in-game footage of different systems and stuff that were just in Alpha One. At this current moment in time, you know, a lot of stuff is being torn down and from the build's perspective and the development branch, you know, a lot of things are getting reworked, redone, and that, of course, is going to introduce a significant amount of bugs because as particular systems <clears throat> and or data changes, uh, that has a cascading effect across, you know, many things that interact with that, with that uh, data. So, um, 
<clears throat> uh, this is just going to be just a brief kind of look at some of the new uh, a new armor set that got implemented in the game, a couple of the mounts, and and just um, you know quick five minutes of that. So nothing too crazy. And but, we have more uh, videos, yeah. so this isn't the yes. only one. We have some more like development. We have many videos. things. Yes. All right. Well, we'll see you all in about five minutes. Welcome, glorious Ashes of Creation community, to another live stream Friday. I welcome you back to the world of Vera. It has been some time since this planet has seen adventures. It is still under construction. We are hard at work changing many of the things. But I wanted to show you some new stuff that has been added recently, including this glorious set of armor. Many of you may recognize it. This is the armor a magistrate might wear. But as you can see, the lands are barren. There are no players present. I can't take you to some of the under construction zones, for they are not ready for mortal eyes yet. But I can show you some new mounts. Um, which one should I show first? Do we want something not living? I guess technically they're both not living. We have two mounts to show you. Both of them aren't living. Let's just go randomly with a flying geode. <laughs> so as you can tell, this guy is a little bit different. Um, he is definitely a little twitchy. And he's got some uh, dangling what appears to be vines that are kind of sticking out of him. Why a geode would have vines, your guess is as good as mine. But, this guy, you know what he reminds me of a little bit? When he flies, you'll, you'll, you'll guess what he reminds me of when he flies. Get ready. Oh, he's walking. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, we're in walk mode. This is his, like, if I, he's walking kind of thing. Look at how my guy's trying to, like, be stable on top. He's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know about this. All right, let's actually fly. Oof. Look at him move. I love his little little tentacles. Yeah, this guy's pretty cool. He has a little jump. Obviously, uh, there still needs to be some, some polish here, but as you can see, the little geo dude is, is a fun one. He's different than your normal mount. All right. Next up, we have another non-living creature. Prepare yourselves. Now, who knows which one this is? This is the Eben. Wait for it. Oh, wait. Why is it There we go. The Eben Omen Mount. Oof. Alright, wait. Let me, let me get a good spot where I can. Now, he still has some uh, visual effects work that is not done yet for him, such as the glowy bits and pieces of his body. As you can see, he is a little bit decomposing. He has an exposed, like, rib cage. That doesn't look like, you know, he might want to get that checked out. This doesn't look good. probably an infection that could take hold at this point. But, uh, no, 
this guy's pretty cool. I like him. Oh, he looks great. But as you can see, uh, in addition to you know what we're doing, working towards Alpha 2, a lot of new assets will be coming online that we're going to be showing as the character environment and animation teams and concept crew get running through all of the master asset list that, that Vera has to build this world up. Um, I know that we've been talking a little bit about you know what we're working towards with Alpha 2, but there's a, a very large and substantial pieces of the game that are intending to be finished by Alpha 2. Still a lot of testing we have to do in between now and then. Um, and we'll be talking more on the stream about the tools that design's using, the optimizations that engineering are making, and uh, all the awesome assets, of course, as always, that our art teams are making. But with every day that passes, Vera comes to life. All right, see you back on stream. All right. I see everyone seems to really like uh, the glimmering geode and some of okay, the Okay, now mounts. what did the geode look? I'm not going to say it, but what <laughs> was it looking like when it flew? <laughs> it totally gave me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, wait, this looks a little bit like that. Okay. That's cool, though. Yeah. I know. I, I, I like the geode. I think, it's <clears throat> I think it's cool to have unique mounts that you know, skirt the, what normalcy is for MMOs. I think yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, we have a kind of a jellyfish mount too. So using that same similar body type. So if, if you guys got that cosmetic, you'll like that. And we'll have more in-game ones that you you can achieve too. But, you know, just a little teaser of some cool stuff that's coming along the lines. Um, but beyond that, let's get into kind of what other things the design team is working on and... Um, we have some videos to showcase in regards to some of that. Yeah. So moving it a little bit in that direction, um, you know, the design team, obviously, as I said previously, has been kind of taking into account a lot of the information we collected from Alpha 1, and we've been kind of going through the different design documentation that we have um, and, and including some changes that we would like to see as a result of Alpha 1 and the, and the insights that we gleaned from that. Um, one of the things that we'll show, and we'll just kind of have it as, an, uh, as a side, but before we get into it, I um, want to explain, like, you know, now as we're moving out of Alpha 1 and into Alpha 2 and we're trying taking into account the synergy between the nodes across the entire world, right? And having over a hundred nodes intended for, <clears throat> for the, for ashes of creation at launch, um, we're starting to, to set up a little bit more definitions between those interactions, the types of alliances that can form, the types of trades route, trade routes that can be present, what sieges, <coughs> Excuse me. What the effects of sieges will have when nodes get taken down? Um, how these nodes will take over territory and adopt, um, you know, the parent relationship and vassal relationship with other nearby nodes. Um, and this is a a, a very com. This is probably the most complex nature of how nodes exist with one another is that expansion component, that vassal parent relationship, the, the, the diplomacy. Um, and um, a few of the designers have been working together to kind of, you know, uh, you know, in the past we kind of put together like little, little mock board games and stuff like that to kind of play out scenarios. Um, but we actually uh, now have a visual representation um, uh, from a program perspective that we can actually simulate um, what these types of progression is going to look like in the world of Vera using the Vera map. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say don't look into this video and think that you can gleam the specific locations of these nodes because they're not, um, that's, the, these are, this is not an accurate representation of the location of specific nodes. Oh, well, you know, people um, are going to hard oh, I know. I on know. this. They're going to like I, be going into every little detail. This is like throwing a, a literal barrel of gasoline on any of the, of the community. It likes to theory craft behind the yeah. node placement and system and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but one of our, one of our designers, uh, Bucky Collins, uh, did, did a great job in kind of setting this up and, um, 
you know, <clears throat> kind of, uh, we can show it now if we want to. Yeah. yeah. This is what yeah, I was I talking about last month, by the way, was this video. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was the, the new there we go. simulation. So here, here you can see, you know, that this is now, you can, you can augment the tick tick rate on this, right, to kind of show passage of time. And you can show the initial territories on the Varen map of what these particular nodes have governance over, or, or their zones of influence, as we like to call them, right? And as nodes, you know, <coughs> as the simulation of this begins to advance and nodes begin to expand their territory and they begin to um, take over nearby nodes as a result of their of their growth um, you start to see these power level these ratings um, that are applied here on on specific nodes and that determines what type of takeover power it has and and what it uh, pushes back against um, for other nodes that are looking to take over new territory as they advance. Um, so this also simulates uh, sieges. It also simulates events. So each of these nodes will have a health ticker. When that health ticker is impacted, it'll stop gaining power or gaining or slow down in its gaining of experience. <clears throat> and that's because certain events can affect a node by disabling certain services, disabling buildings. If players don't respond to that horde of zombies that have, you know, come out of the, uh, out of the nearby ravine, um, then those zombies can attack stables. They can attack service buildings and 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 prevent uh, particular types of quests or um, activities and services from from happening until it's repaired. Right. So <clears throat> it simulates that. It simulates the sieges. If if a particular um, node has a has a certain frequency that's set, where um, uh, we want to see randomization of how nodes get affected by sieges. Um, sometimes they'll be destroyed in the simulation. Sometimes they'll be um, have disabled services again, similar to an event, because they didn't succeed necessarily at sieging the node, but they did succeed at disabling some of the buildings as part of that siege. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of these, you know, this representation does show 111 nodes as part of the uh, as part of this particular simulation. Um, I'm not sure what the tick frequency is on this video. Um, it might be something on the magnitude of like every second is um, you know probably 12 to 24 hours um, so over time you know you start seeing these larger um, um, node systems building up to eventually where you might see you know cities and metropolises after some period of time um, and what this does you know what this allows uh, the design team to to kind of do from a tools perspective as they simulate this this idea of how the world is going to progress is <clears throat> it gives an opportunity to kind of see strange happenings or something that we couldn't necessarily predict uh, but was a a possible outcome based on the variables present um, that players could potentially simulate as or excuse me it simulates what players could potentially do as well when the game goes live um, and that might include things like splitting up a particular zone of influence across a waterway right having having your territory expand out to an island or across continents um, <clears throat> you know these are these are the types of things that we want to see uh, players do eventually obviously but uh, this this tool provides the design team the opportunity to see it repetitively and over a fast period of time so they see these different types of outcomes the the chat is excited and they they, they are concerned that we're sharing too much information publicly oh no 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 no, no. that's okay don't don't worry about that yeah, it's, we got uh, it. <laughs> There's a there's a whole side panel here that actually you can't see that I asked Margaret this morning to yeah I was to, like how am I going to hide take this off. <laughs> yeah and uh, you know the side panel has a lot of data points that are collected and the weighted values of these particular data points that that nodes can exhibit through you know development through player activity through you know whatever. Um, and again, these locations aren't the locations of the particular nodes, but they do show what that interaction, what that, what that almost territory-like, um, um, you know, politicking will be between nodes. Yeah, the um, persistence and how it will yeah. evolve over time, uh, which Absolutely. I'm very excited about. I've played, there's only a few games that have that kind of persistence over long periods of time, um, but all of them have been really fun. So I'm excited to see it come to fruition, especially in an MMORPG where, you know, like 
I don't know, especially when you can have your own space and your own house and your own freehold. Um, it's going to be exciting to see what players do and how each of the servers does different things too. Cause oh, yeah. your guys' actions on different, like there's maybe like a 0.01% chance that two servers could have the same situation, but very unlikely, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, obviously, as we've spoken about many times since the inception of, of Ashes and, mm -hmm. and the node system is the cool component of having different servers experience different things, the way that content is gated behind world development is also an interesting method by which this content gets trickled out to the player base based on their you know decisions essentially um <clears throat> and how that affects the story overall right that's that's the big appeal to ashes that's what we are doing differently than a lot of mmos you know that have come before us um and you know what that means is we have to create an abnormally larger amount of curated content so that those decisions from the player mean something um, and just aren't you know obfuscated behind the player driven you know um, quote unquote terminology um, you want to have complementary curated uh, content that that exists and makes the world feel reactionary to the players um, which is and definitely that's, uh, you know a hard thing to achieve um, I think yeah. that I was even having a chat with some of the other designers about that and like how quests are going to work and how those systems Absolutely. are going to be integrated into the node system. It's very intriguing. Um, and a lot of yeah, discussion I just had that a, design. I just had a three hour on. meeting yesterday on quests <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, what we, what we took out of alpha one and, and obviously, you know, the outstanding feature work that wasn't completed by alpha one, but, you know, doubling down on those designs um, and providing that, as the goal for Alpha 2 is to actually implement that more modular, reactionary type um, questing systems that, <clears throat> you know, are less about go do, X, you know, A, B, and C and come back and, and chat with me and more about how, like, when you're on that path and the world is actively developing, you know, how that changes what your objectives are, what your destination is, what the, you, you know, like adversary is. something and you're like, oh, I interact yes. with this crate and now like, oh, I have the option to either take this to who it belongs to because it does have a label on it or I can just mm. take it for myself. But if someone catches me trying to sell it or something, maybe there's reactions, right? Like those kind of oh. makes you actually Mark feel like... Mark a little just, thief. Yeah, you're you're going to be part of the Thieves Guild, huh? Yeah. You know. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> you know, everyone everyone has their own path that they might take, but I think that's very exciting. And obviously, this is the thing that I was talking about last uh, month that I thought was really cool. And he's made some adjustments to it too, which I think is just really it's great to see and uh, probably helps design a lot in regards to. What oh yeah, absolutely. On. Yeah, I mean the the design team has been doing a, a great job, um, and and honestly, like. One of the things I love about, you know, working with designers as opposed to engineers or artists is that like, you know, they're constantly thinking all the alternate design. ways, yeah, exactly, all the, all the alternate ways at which these intents diverge, you know, and what directions they could potentially go and, and how, you know, you want to engage with the player, not just on the fundamental idea of immersion, but from a mechanical standpoint, you know, what are the ways players are going to game the system because we're players ourselves and how can we ac account for those potential gamings of the systems, you know? Steven um, will game the system. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a very important aspect whenever you, you're discussing system design is, you know, if you have that experience and you're a gamer and your mind works that way, that's good because you already have a leg up on your on your community in the sense that you can predict certain things. Now, obviously, you can't Not predict everything. Not everything, man. And, they and, no, will no, be I know. playing a obviously, lot more hours. <laughs> uh, obviously, you cannot predict everything. But, um, you know, if you can go through and identify a lot of this stuff as part of your design work, um, that's a super important thing. And so, as you all yeah. know, nodes are kind of the core heart of everything. Like ev almost every system touches it. So it's very important for us to solidify everything, make sure that, you know, everything's kind of going in the direction that they want. A lot of the stuff that you have probably experienced during alpha was data collection and seeing how that process works and how they integrate with our quests coming online, uh, new nodes unlocking, that kind of stuff. So um, now it's going to be the next level, the, the, next, yeah. the next edition of that. And potentially, you know, seeing Metropolis. Metropolis, Metropolises, Metropolis. Metropolis, Metropolises, Metropolis. 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 Um, all right. 
beyond that, uh, is there anything else that the design team is working on that you want to discuss? Or do we kind of want to talk about what they can expect to see in the next few months versus like the long term? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, right now the design team, again, is, is doubling down kind of on these discussions and, and adjustments we want to make. The pitch pitch phases are kind of underway um, <clears throat> in how we're going to be changing some of the systems. Um, but also there's going to be some significant prototyping phases coming up as well, especially on the combat front. I think we've got a great direction from Alpha One with that implementation of split body. Um, we're going to be taking a look at um, some additional universal skills that could potentially be applied, such as universal block and dodge and uh, potentially parry and, and stuff that <clears throat> kind of lend itself a little bit more towards the action side or at least towards the skill side of of having these options and then being able to potentially be universal progressions as well you know where players can enhance those universal abilities uh, if they wish to allocate skill points into that um, so this is this is something that you know obviously we're taking a look at we're going to be working on and, and prototyping and and it's going to be pitched as as part of the uh, uh, combat discussions uh, but you can probably expect to see a lot of conversation related um, uh, discussion topics from community on certain things with perhaps even some demonstrations of the prototyping so that you guys get context for what you're talking about. Um, that might be pretty cool to see, uh, and that'll probably come online over the next couple months. Yeah. And, you know, anything that we can go more in depth with, we will put, you know, video and articles out with. But a lot of the stuff that you're going to see is, you know, maybe little short snippets here and there uh, on social or here on our on our live stream. We always try to keep sure... Uh, Keep sure, make sure our keep live stream, sure. <laughs> keep sure, make sure our live stream has kind of like everything encompassed. So if you missed anything, you kind of have everything that we've done uh, in one little bit for you. Um, yeah. Cool. And keep in mind one other thing, like as you guys are looking at this map, this, the world of Vera is very large. Um, it is a pretty big MMO world from a, at least comparative standards to other MMOs. So, um, you know, these types of territories, these types of, of, of parent, um, you know, vassal structures that exist within the world, um, they're, they're going to have large swaths, large regions, uh, by which they have influence, uh, over. And um, I think that's gonna that's gonna equate to a, a pretty fun experience between eight to ten thousand players who all coexist on this map, um, and and the decisions they're going to make and how they want to form the world and change that structure, whether through force or through diplomacy. Um, and I think this this just does a really great job of demonstrating how diverse that ecosphere of politics will end up being when the game is live. I'm excited. I love, I love like the guild culture in an MMO because you get like, there's smaller guilds, there's bigger guilds, there's like, guilds that collaborate, there's guilds that have like turmoil between them. And you get to just see that all come to fruition on like a massive scale, which is really fun. Um, there's been some products that I've worked on that have persistent worlds and it's always crazy to like see how it pans out. Um, and when you log in in the morning, kind of like seeing how the map looks. Um, from a development side is really fun. Uh, and, and also watching the heat maps and how, how people like interact with the world and, you know, where they're kind of tending to go to the most versus not. And it changes ser to, from server to server. So it's intriguing. I'm excited to, to see it all come to fruition. Maybe we'll have to do like news reporters from each server who come together on oh, like yeah. a community live stream. And we, we did that. In another, like we station. did that. Yeah. We, I, my guild did that in another game we played. Um, it was fun. We had like a little house set up and we had like uh, green boxes and green screen behind the characters and the characters are kind of do like little news reports. Yeah. Um, it was fun. It was cool. We'll have we to pop into that. each of the different servers and see how it's going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm really excited. Uh, that's the stuff for me. Uh, you know, someone else in chat asked earlier before the stream started, like at, from our community management perspective, obviously I'm not the community manager, but, you know, I, I aid with that stuff. Um, and I get to hear, you know, Sarah and uh, Vachner's uh, perspectives on things. Um, that is the funnest part for us. It's like more fun for us to be able to like interact with you guys and engage and see all the cool things that come out of that and all the cool content you guys create. So that that is very much a lot of the fun for us is, is figuring out ways we can, uh, you know, I'm gonna give you. Great uh, stuff you guys are I'm gonna doing. give you, by the way, a little uh, snippet of Ash's uh, development lore. Um, <clears throat> right. This this particular map 
as you, it's a little bit different the map the itself map. yeah than, than the original map i had from a campaign you know with pathfinder mm -hmm. uh 10 or 11 years ago or whatever it was oh, yeah i've seen that um, one is the one that you have yeah, you your see, house. Okay. yes yeah. yes so that one i have like you know the seas are made of resin and like this topographical like cool mountains put, like, and stuff thing. That's so yes cool. so i used to have so you see here it has like a grid square like a through w and one through 33 so those correlate to, to specific squares that exist on the map. So what that comes from is originally on my physical board that I ran the campaign on, players would have the opportunity to do things on off weeks, right? Like you would have your normal session. In the session, it would be hour-to-hour, day-to-day gameplay. But then during the off week, they would have like, you know, city development, building up their nodes, their leadership feats, and like all their followers and what businesses they have and stuff like that. And... Um, they would have movement of followers or armies or citizens, and I would have a, a sheet that they would have to fill out to submit their movements for a particular week and what they were doing. And so they'd have to correlate those, the grid, like, you know, I'm moving army in section F8 to section G11, right? Like and risk it's going vibes. To, yeah, exactly. And so like everyone's movements would have to come in simultaneously. They wouldn't know what other people were doing per se. And you could have empires fighting each other. So I would have the board out and we would put down flags and like nodes, like where people were building stuff up and where their army banners were moving in the board as well as essentially an empire like, you know, uh, uh, control game. And uh, somehow, and I don't know how this happened, but that the, the grid structure a through w and one through 33 got taken over into the uh, into the video game development and i'm like why do we have these things there it's like i don't know it was on it's a picture handy, i though. saw of yours. It's, nice, it's, it's nice to be able to like be like this section and i'm sorry if you hear uh yeah. gardening stuff in the background my gardener comes like every other friday and sometimes it falls on the live stream friday um but yeah i think it's super handy yeah. to be able to like point out no, the locations sure. i like yeah, it yeah it was it was good times. <laughs> that that is cool though, um, but I also think it will be handy for people just to have that kind of specific, uh, you know, longitude, latitude, almost vibe going. Yeah. All right. I do have a question that I know everyone's going to keep asking. Um, maybe I should have brought it up during the studio update, but um, folks are going to keep asking this in regards to community side. Um, if you have figured out who you're going to be pulling on for lead game design, um, as I know that that is definitely a community. I have many questions that I ask <laughs> yeah. that on a daily basis. For sure. And that's a good question. Um, you know, right now, of course, I've assumed a lot of the responsibilities uh, from a lead designer perspective uh, in the interim. I, I, you know, I've chatted with a lot of candidates and it's important uh, from my perspective that you, you hire slow and meaningful and intentful. Um, and Ashes of Creation is a very special baby. Uh, <laughs> and I want to make sure it has the best caretaker possible in that regard and for that position. So, um, you know, when, when that happens, I'm not going to rush anything, so to speak. Um, but when that happens, of course, we're going to inform the community and, and, and introduce, uh, the individual, but, um, you know, it's, it, it may take some time, um, because I'm pretty particular, uh, on who we, <clears throat> who we want to fill that it role. It took you like two years to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, it's a good thing I waited because we got such an amazing person. Aww. Aww. It's too nice. That was going to make me blush. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that it's important. It's the same reason why on the content creator side, like I just haven't, like that is going to be such an important person because they're going to be interacting with like a whole bunch of people in our community that are sub communities of our community. Um, so I agree with Steven on that front, you know, it's finding the right people. And, you know, from our perspective, uh, when it comes to hiring, you know, we're trying to never have layoffs or anything like that. Like we're really trying to like build oh, yeah, we are. that type of culture. And to do that, you have to do it smartly and pick the right people and not grow too quickly because that's when you're spending too much money and it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I think to wrap up the design segment, we've got a death animation video to showcase. Do you want to oh, yeah. this, this is, a little bit? This is just a quick update. Remember back in the day when we were talking to you about how like death effects, you know, you have this cool effect that is typically like a level up or a resurrection, but the death is always just a character falling to the ground. And, you know, I've always felt like in MMOs, that's very lackluster. You know, like if I'm dying, that should be a cause for either celebration or, you know, just complete 
dread and terror. Um, and <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but um, uh, so we talked a little bit about potentially having an ashes uh, oriented effect that occurs on death. And of course, the reason for that is the lore behind, you know, <laughs> ashes how death creation. and resurrection right how death how death and resurrection exists within ashes of creation um is the concept of this avatar of the phoenix you know being representative of the goddess of creation from which you know all life on this plane has has come from essentially um and something else i know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um and, uh, you know, I thought that this played well to that effect because when you do get reborn, it's that it is that connection with your soul to the essence that binds you with the goddess of creation that brings that spark of the of that avatar of the phoenix back and brings you, you know, to life through that um, to that manipulation of the essence. So um, this is a little update on the ashes effect. Now, to keep in mind, obviously, there's necessary indicators for death, right? Right. Um, yeah, you can play it. Okay. Absolutely. Um, there is necessary. Um, there we go. There's necessary uh, information that must be conveyed, of course, to uh, nearby players. One is the location of the body. If you want to select them and attempt to resurrection. Um, two is does that uh, does that interactable have um, have uh, uh, excuse me have a equipment or or gatherables or something that you can interact with a uh, inventory and grab items from. <clears throat> now this is for players um, and not for mobs, of course. Um, but those can be conveyed through, you know, lit embers uh, that exist within the ash pile. Um, <clears throat> you should still be able to select the ash pile to potentially resurrect. Uh, when you select it, you're still going to get the character name above uh, on a targeting nameplate. Um, you know, this is a type of stuff that we want to make sure we still convey, even though we're implementing this type of effect. Um, but I think, you know, when you think about combat, especially mass combat, and you're fighting left and right, um, and people are just bursting into flames as they're dying, I think that's just going to be such a, such a much more epic event um with those types of effects going off left and right um than just watching bodies fall to the ground <laughs> all right and moving on from there we have some cool stuff from our engineering team which you know we don't always get to show what engineering is working on often we just get to talk about it because you know security reasons and things of that sort um or because it's you know code and it's hard to visualize that until it's uh created into a system that design or art has um, had their hands on. Um, so talk a little bit about what we're about to see here and then I'll play it while you're talking about it. Does that sound right? Sure. What am I looking, what, what are we talking about again? We'll start One with thing. the unmerged version. Oh, the I see, I see, yeah. I see, I see. <clears throat> okay, so this is from engineering's perspective. Um, you know, we've talked about wanting to show you something and we can't really show you code. But what we can show you is the effects of optimization. And um, we have one particular engineer who's been working on um, kind of the rendering side of how we can show a lot of people on screen, a gentleman by the name of Clayton, Clayton Stamper. Um, and to give context here, at least from a terminology standpoint, you know, when we're talking about materials, materials are essentially these data objects that are comprised of textures, you know, parameters that inform um, the shader, how a mesh is intending to be rendered on the client side. Um, and, you know, draw calls are essentially a CPU telling the GPU what to draw. It's a process of feeding, you know, all the textures and parameters to the GPU so that it can start churning out triangles. And, and GPUs calculate stuff very fast. So every time the CPU has to actually integrate it with something else to draw, the GPU has to move all of its data around, known as context uh, switching. Um, what was that? Oh, <laughs> she meowed. <laughs> oh, little kitty. That helps the technical jargon, actually. I like that. Um, <laughs> she was like, what's happening? I need to hear. I need to listen. So, so this context switching um, can take you know, time away from actually doing the rendering. So we can show um, here what Clayton's been working on, which is essentially taking materials, which were previously like chest, shirt, bracer, gloves, you know, shoulder, legs, boots, helmet, face, body, um, taking so those different bodies. materials. And I know, so this is a thousand players 
being rendered on screen. Obviously, they're not animating, they're not doing special effects, they're not casting abilities, but from just a render perspective of these meshes, of these materials that are demonstrated, all those different pieces, um, you know, they're all all drawing separately. Um, and and being able to use a single material with the, obviously with the exception of like, um, you know, different organic components that, that get LOD'd out quickly, um, the GPU only expects one call per player instead of one call per piece of equipment on the player. So here in this video, and I, this is the first one, right? This is yes. unmerged. Yeah. I, so I here, Clayton, you told me to. here Clayton's demonstrating, you know, the unmerged 1000 um, rendering. <clears throat> and this, you can't see it here, but you could see it normally on the, on the right side. The oh, FPS for a thousand yeah. players, and again, the reason why this optimiz optimization is important is because we intend to have, our goal right now is 250 versus 250, but we want to be able to, to have, you know, or at least target a thousand players for a particular battle, right? We've, we've mentioned that in the past. We want to try to get yeah. up to 500 versus 500. So these optimization efforts are to that end. And here you see that the FPS in the top right corner is like seven or eight on average. So not too good from a rendering perspective. Um, so we can show the next video. Okay, I will change it. So by merging, <clears throat> now you can see that the same thousand players who are wearing the same armors as previously are actually having a 300% increase, 300 to 400% increase in the performance of the, of the FPS. So it went from seven to about 21 on average. And that is a significant optimization point um, that obviously, this is just the beginning of the optimization efforts, right? Alpha 1 wasn't about rendering optimization. It, it was about more of the networking layer. It was about, you know, the technical components of our core systems um, and standing those up. But now that we're moving into optimization, being able to render large amounts of not even just players, actually, this is also applicable to monsters and creatures as well, because we have events that will have have hundreds, if not thousands, of of different creatures that are sieging, or not sieging, but attacking a node. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of this is, you know, is initial efforts um, within uh, within these efforts towards optimizing optimizing the render client. So there's a, a little bit of of engineering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate us uh, covering the, their stuff. So I know uh, often they're like, uh, McPee's like, I can just show you some some code really quick. Um, but I know that a lot of them are working on tech debt stuff uh, at the moment as well. So a lot of things from our Alpha One that they're they're fixing up bug fixes and working on some new systems like the character creator and um, quite a few other things. Like they will be uh, touching touching. Uh, as we move forward. Um, yeah, and you guys make else. sure as you guys, as, as the, as the live video comes out on YouTube for this, for this stream, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, make sure you comment on whether or not you like seeing this type of stuff. You know, I, I know a lot, a lot of times art and design get a lot of the glory from just a in your face kind of perspective, but engineering is, is the magic that makes the miracle kind of work. Right. Yeah, and, like um, blue. Everything. It's yeah, right. So if you do like kind of seeing this stuff and hearing about this stuff, make sure to comment that you did enjoy it and you want to see more of it. Oh, they definitely do. I think we've done we did a, a couple social posts where we asked people what they want to see and they definitely said they want to see more uh, tech behind the scenes stuff. I know that one of the questions that comes up and I figure we might as well bring it up now uh, due to the conversation that we're having at the moment is UE five and what our plans are in regards to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we do have a team that's kind of investigating and evaluating tech mm -hmm. as we see tech come online. Um, I don't know if you want to go into more details in regards to that. Um, I wasn't planning on talking about that. But... Talking about it. I think I covered most <laughs> I mean, of it anyway, I, I, is that I, I, we're always looking I, yeah. at that stuff. I, right? As I've said in the past, um, you know, it is our responsibility, of course, to ensure the project's viability from a technology standpoint, you know, post launch, not just at this current stage, but planning ahead of time for, you know, the types of capabilities, expansions that are going to be present, the the underlying, you know, foundation of the of the development and, and an engine, of course, is is the 
probably biggest piece of that pie. Um, Unreal 5 has some has some great capabilities. It has a, a lot of amazing uh, tech that Epic and Unreal Engine have developed for um, that particular next iteration of the Unreal Engine. <clears throat> It is, of course, our responsibility, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, actually, no, I'm sorry, a few months ago, um, I did ask a few of our team members to begin evaluating Unreal Engine 5. Um, a few weeks ago, we formed a, a, um, a um, official um, strike team that we call it <laughs> uh, strike team Steven to evaluate to strike teams <laughs> i do like to call things strike teams what else do quorums I call, uh, strike and strike teams, teams. oh yeah quorums like small yeah. councils strike councils, teams yeah, yeah. <laughs> it comes up with like, new names <laughs> i'm sorry but anyways this this specific strike team is is intending to uh have representatives from every department on the development team um to go through tech for unreal engine 5 and of course as as we evaluate it and we make a determination on um moving forward, um, we'll keep the community apprised of, of, of those decisions um, and um, explain things as we go forward. It's a common high question that we get. We get a lot of people who ask For sure. That, so I know you weren't maybe ready. All right. I'm going to move I also, into I also right, use Task Force. I'm sorry. Sorry. Just oh, reminded yeah, me. Force. I also, I also yeah. used Task Force. When I, was in, when I uh, used to be a guild leader, um, I, I designated groups of people as strike teams or task force a lot. So, And then we also had an engineering core that were the crafters and the farmers and stuff. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, we're going to move into art and we'll try to go through these pretty quickly because we do want to wrap up and also do some Q&A. Um, and I know Steven is a busy guy, he probably has a lot on his plate. Oh, no. Uh, I know. Um, so moving over to environment, we're going to kick it off with some, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what they're working on and uh, show you guys some props that they're working on. Obviously, continued uh, work on props and updates and replacing uh, some of those uh, previous items with some new ones. Uh, these ones in particular are the Kalar ones, and we'll also be showing off some Dunier and Empyrean ones. Um, these are desks, a chair, and stools, so you can see the, the different vibes of them. Um, they're working on legacy asset cleanup, some node R&D, which is like research and development um, in regards to landscapes, towns, towns all the way through metropolises, 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 uh, systems overhauls and evaluations from, po uh, from post Alpha 1 feedback and things of that nature. They're also working on world landscape development and the pipeline reevaluation re in regards to that and tools and feature overhaul post Alpha 1. So kind of like talking about what they're going to be uh, doing further in detail uh, in regards to those things. Um, and also landscape edit layer tech, which I know another kind of more nerdy tech thing, um, but they're working on that. And uh, some of that is for non-destructive workflow. Um, and then the other side of it is that they're going to be doing systems documentation for animated buildings, construction, damage, and a lot of the siege features that we want to put in post alpha one. Um, so yeah, just a lot of cool stuff. Moving on to do near so you can see some cool do near props that they're working on. The detail so great. Yeah. Love the detail. Amazing stuff. And, you know, when we start having housing and being able to place things in your house, I think it's going to be so fun. I mean, we have housing. We had oh, an yeah. Apple one as well. It just wasn't as, you know, you couldn't like place all the things that you wanted to and upgrade items and craft items for it yet. yet. Um, and the fireplace, we have some paintings, some pots and a weapon rack for the Dunier. And then for the Empyrean, we've got... Hey, look at that dwarf face. <laughs> the painting. Yeah. Um, I know you guys are excited by dwarves. I'll talk a little bit about that in character art side. Um, but we will be showing more dwarf stuff probably next month. I think we had said like two months from the time of last uh, stream, we would have more dwarven things. But we are working on some dwarf uh, revamping as per a lot of feedback from the community. So thank you so much for all your feedback in regards to the way they look. Um, in fact, we had some internal discussions regarding how they looked. So um, I think that, you know, it was an easy, easy decision for us to make to make that change. Um, and so here you're going to see some paintings, some supplies, uh, some lighting fixtures, and some signs that you'll see on buildings. And this is kind of like a post that can be utilized in town. Yeah. Very beautiful. I saw I saw somebody said they wanted to see some orcs. 
I don't have any orcs for this one yet. Oh. But we what are working that, on some orcs. What about that stuff. one image? Remember that one image? You could share that one image if you want. I can grab it. It's up to you. I mean, you. we can. I mean, we can. Okay. We can preface. Yeah, while you grab it, let me preface okay. it. So obviously, you know, we're now going around and taking a look at the different races that didn't quite make it into Alpha 1. Um, one of those particular races, as we're modeling the base body um, for the Ren Kai, um, obviously getting your feedback <clears throat> on this, I think would be a cool would be a cool uh, uh, touch point with the community as we're as we're working on this actively, um, and we could probably you know even after the stream if you want to we could even throw up a like a little you know dev discussion preview of the bodies and see people's kind of reactions to the Renkai and their representation and we'll stuff. We'll do some social posts too for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be cool. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you have the image on. I sent it to you. I sent yeah, it yeah. the other day, right? Yeah. I'm going to put it um, in the character art section. Nice. We go oh, okay, the cool. Art stuff. Very cool, very cool. We'll, we'll kick um, it off with that. So just keep in mind that the Renkai, of course, you know, for those of you guys who don't remember, the Renkai are more, <clears throat> you know, bulky, bigger statu stature kind of, of orc, right? Um, and one of the discussion points that we had is like the ability to, to have variant skin tones among the orc race. Because traditionally, right, orcs have just kind of been demonstrated as either red or green, right? And you don't really have much agency from a character creator standpoint on if you would want to be one or the other a little bit. So here you can see the Renkai base character model, and its size, its stature, its this is a middle of the road type of physique, right? Because the idea from a character creator standpoint is that you're going to be able to augment different components of his body. Um, you're going to have scales that can, not, sorry, not scales, you're going to have scalers that can deform or create a less muscular physique if you want it, a little bit more out of the shape. Um, but this is the green one. Do we have the other one yep. as well? I have the red one. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. So like here's a variant color and being able to kind of choose in between the red and or the green, um, having the ability to kind of um, slide. Did I say scalers? Uh, sliders. Thank you, Diggs. Yeah, Appreciate that. Sliders. <laughs> scalers, well, sorry. I, we Is all know early... where you were going with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Scalers, sliders. <laughs> you all know. We've made a, we've all seen character creators before. Yes. But these guys stand considerably taller than their human counterparts, um, the Renkai do. Um, and as as this gets online for uh, Alpha 2, <clears throat> and um, you guys can see, as we'll compare them head-to-head -head, um, with other races, uh, these the Renkai are the tallest species, the tallest race in, um, in Ashes of Creation. All right, I'm just going to back up to environment for one moment. We kind of skipped ahead a little. <laughs> Should we show one other thing? One, maybe just one more thing? Is it the dwarf stuff? Yes. Yeah. So uh, huge go... feedback. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. We can go back to environment. Let's do yeah, that. Yeah. Just because we character. didn't wrap up environment, so that they're in I'm, the segment because we kind of like. I'm just like jumping around. around. Margaret right now is just like Stephen. What are you it's doing? Because I have to do like the timestamps <laughs> for everything, so I know, I know. <laughs> it's like if we jump around. I'm um, sorry. It's okay. Uh, so we do have one other thing from art, which is, and I know you're going to be excited about this one too, Stephen. And while we're talking about this, I'll go grab the dwarf stuff. Um, we have concept art for the volcano area and also the transition oh, yeah. from the volcano area uh, to nice. the other, to like the other uh, like foresty realm. Very cool. Um, and then also, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the ashy version too. Which Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so as you guys know, we have many biomes in Ashes of Vision. Uh, but one of the things we're playing with, you know, that kind of ties into uh, a little bit maybe of the weather system, but I guess it's not just a weather system, right? It's like even an event system, like ash coming out of a, of a volcano impacting the, the local biome with this kind of ash, you know, material layer, whatever that, that exists on, uh, you know, terrain or um, foliage actors and stuff like that, just to, just to go the next level in seeing how events change the world, seeing how weather can change the world. Um, so you have a lot of these concepts of these of these biomes and not just the biomes, but but these types of natural events that occur, the lava flowing, the you know, whatever. <clears throat> 
and how that affects the nearby area. So love these concept pieces. I think a lot of these are from Ricky. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doing a, a great job. You know, obviously concepts are a huge and very important piece of the, of the, of the asset pipeline because you know this is what modelers have to reference um, when they're kind of making sure they're hitting the mark on what the target goal visually is uh, for a particular area or for a particular asset. And like um, you guys have seen, you see the concept art and then you've seen the end game and it's like hard yeah. to tell sometimes. Oh the yeah, Mo the, our modelers are very talented modelers. Um, you know, they <clears throat> they really stay true to what the concept piece is. Um, and getting that mood down from an art style vibe. perspective. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Now we can switch over. I've got your dwarf ready. Here you go. Dwarf All right. Boy. So to to preface the dwarf boy, let's just say <laughs> this is some work that's been done to amend the dwarven body and appearance from the Dunier's it's perspective. Still a work in progress. It's still a work in progress. However, it's very important that you guys recognize. Our goal is to take community feedback into account when we're developing the game. And that's the whole purpose of a transparent development process is imagine if we didn't have the opportunity to hear from the players how they feel Junior Dwarf should look. And then <clears throat> we build a bunch of stuff around the Dunier Dwarfs and all the character armor and all, you know, the race related uh, the uh, production everything, and the yeah. animation, everything. And we get to a launch point or we get to a beta point And now it's really much more difficult to go back and change things. Um, so that's why it's super important. You guys give your commentary and you tell us, you know, what you're looking for, because we get to go back and we get to amend the model and we get to change things. And that's answering basically what you guys as the players have given us as the developers information that is very important to the development. So super big shout out to you guys at the, in the community, giving us your feedback, telling us what you would like to see, because it is a great directionary tool um, for us to take a look at and then, and then use as reference pieces, even potentially uh, where we get to change these things. All right. And I'm just going to show uh, our lovely orc folks again, just for, uh, if you didn't and you're watching this like post live stream, we did talk a little bit more about the orcs in the previous segment. So definitely go check that out. Um, if I forget to put the timestamp in there, but here's Margaret's going to kill me after this stream. Green like... one. <laughs> I'm not gonna kill you. Uh, I'm and then here's kidding. the red version, but we have, you know, a lot of work in progress in regards to orcs um, and where they're going to be playing out. This is just yeah. the base model. So you can, you know, go a little bit wider, more muscular or less muscular. All right, next up, we've got our Halcyon Spire, which we'll show here. Um, so this is kind of the progress uh, you'll see here is, uh, I thought I had to start with the concept, but I guess it's going backwards. Um, so we have the concept art for it, then you get to see kind of like what the high poly model looks like, and then of course the final product. Um, but it looks pretty amazing. I think the art team did a fantastic job. I think Steven has some concerns with how it's like curved, but you know, maybe we'll make Yeah, I know. I think the, the detail is, is amazing. Um, <clears throat> and I think it looks great. Uh, the only thing I would probably take a look at is just that kind of um, more uh, concave. Uh, I like it. Yeah, it's like different. It. It's I don't know if I like it or don't yet, but uh, the <laughs> the model itself is beautiful. Um, I'm excited and, to see uh, someone cosplay make cosplay of it too, because people yeah, have made absolutely. some cosplay of some of our other uh, shields and swords before. For sure. And we won't show this guy for too long, but this is our Eben, um, our Eben Omen, which uh, Stephen did show off in game as well. If you were watching, no, it's portion. it's. It still has some effects work that needs to be done um, to kind of bring the glowiness out of those in interior um, You could see it pulsating under sections. its tummy, though. Cause yes. You know, like, oh, I like it. Oh, yeah. I want to see that when this guy gets summoned, that, like, the little crows fly away and, diff like, disperse. Like, as he's getting summoned out of, you know, you're pulling him out of your inventory or whatever, these little crows just fly away and make some caw sounds, and he disappears. Oh, yeah, that'd though. be cool. That's cool. I'm into it. All right. And then next up, we have the spectral eye. And you're going to see the same process, the concept art for this, uh, then the high poly model, which you're seeing right now, and then the final product. And also a on it on a model here for you. 
Yeah, I love that. I think Atkins did this guy or did this one, the uh, yes. the eye thing. It looks so simple in the concept, and then when you see it on, it actually looks like a little bit more intricate. Oh cool. yeah, this is what is this like a, a gem of true sight? Maybe. Like, oh, that'd be kind of cool. You just see any invisible creatures and or players. No. <laughs> I think maybe for the MP, for the NPC version, right? But player version, this is just a cosmetic. Doesn't actually yeah. get out of it. But we will have other versions of like eye patch like things. So um, mm. if you like that vibe and that look, we'll have more in-game things that you can attain. Um, and then the magistrate, which, you know, Steven showed off in game as well, but I want to give you kind of those like, Oh, I should have, I should images. have been a female character. I like her. I like her hat. Her it's hat's more like cool. a crown almost. Yeah. This, 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 is, this is a crown, but a different style. It's very much like gesture almost. I right. also really liked the, the physics on the cloth. I think those are weighted perfectly. It was, it was looking pretty cool. It's not I was perfect, writing. I think, when you like turn around, it's still kind yeah, of Yeah, no, that's, a little. that's getting true. There. We just need to put like bounds where it can flap around too. But I thought as I was like riding the horse per se, and it was like trailing behind me, like that type of waiting was really cool. I know talking to Catkins, he's like the cloth stuff is <laughs> the, <laughs> the waiting on cloth, like whether it's like, you know, a beautiful dress or like a, a cloak, or in this case, it's kind of like almost like a scarf vibe. Uh, is definitely always a pain in the booty. But once you get it, oh, yeah. it looks so lovely and fantastic. Um, but yeah, it's looking sick. And then I have a turntable of this for you all as well. Oh, a turntable. So yeah. fancy. Yeah. You know, the one Beautiful. thing this outfit they is missing. They post it like the, the concept art. Sorry, It's ahead. missing sandals. They need sandals. You didn't have sandals in the concept art. Right? I know, I know. Well, some people like to show off their toes. I was That's joking true. that we should put like little emojis on the feet, <laughs> so we did. Because <laughs> like a lot of people do that on social media right now. I know. My doctor said I can't wear sandals anymore, so. I know. Of course. Maybe that's how are you going to be the put... sandal lord? I I don't even know. I would just carry a sandal with me, <laughs> just like put it in my pocket or something. Just like you're like uh you know you, if someone's naughty you just take the sandal out. Yeah, just smack him. <laughs> HR. <laughs> Stacy's like, what's happening? Why no, are no. we slapping people with sandals? Um, all right. That is it for our um, character art at the moment. A lot of them are working actually on um, fixing up some of the models and things like that. They're are working on our dwarf model. So the, that's all that stuff is kind of being in the work in progress and also pumping out some of the other creatures that we have Um I think some of the more mount and pet oriented creatures so that we can fill the world up a little bit more for design um, in regards to dungeons and things that they have planned. Like the next set is actually the next cosmetic set is for a specific dungeon. So definitely stay tuned for the lore on that because it's pretty sick. Um, and uh, we'll get right into the Q&A and we'll wrap things up if that works for you, Stephen, unless you have something extra you want to add. Sounds good. No, I don't think so. Okay. I do have a hard stop at 1230, though, so I don't know how okay. many questions we have. Let's try to power through as many as we can. All right. All right. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Uh, the first one is from Sunscript on the forums asking about Alpha 1 archetypes, and they want to know, should we be expecting any significant changes to the ability list shown for the archetypes that were, that were playable in Alpha 1? And I would say yeah, yes. Yes. Right? Absolutely. 100. The ab the ability list in Alpha One <clears throat> is nowhere near what the ability list will be, especially from like a level slash progression standpoint. Um, so you can expect that it to be incredibly different. Next one is from Morph the Great, wanting to know about difficult content. What is your opinion on allocating dev resources to make something that only a tiny percentage of people will experience, like a quest achievable for one person? And would it that be possible? So they're looking for like that think, high end content. I think there's I think there's ways that you can still achieve that high end content that's like one off, um, but not have as much production resources allocated to creating that particular one off. You can still leverage the mass production, you know, perspective of how we go about curating content and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but I do think it's really cool to have those types of things in place. So that is something that will be present in Ashes. All right. Our next question here is about weapon combos from Azhere. 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 I don't know how to say your name, so if I'm saying it wrong, I apologize. I gave you five different options. Um, but the question is regarding weapon combos. 
were the attack strings we saw from melee weapons in Alpha 1 part of the weapon use combo system that has been mentioned in previous information on weapons, or is the weapon use combo system still intended as something else entirely? Um, the combo system plays heavily into <clears throat> the weapon skill trees that were not present in Alpha 1. However, um, there will be certain types of effects and or procs that can occur based on what stage in a combo attack you are a part of. And you can potentially augment that necessity with set bonuses and gear bonuses as well. So for example, let's say you have, you know, dual daggers and you as a rogue, you know, have a lot of effects that um, in your active ability system <clears throat> that have additional synergies with a bleed effect. And your bleed proc occurs on a potentially, with some percentage, on a third attack with your dual daggers because you specced into that um, weapon skill tree to have that potential bleed effect occur. Um, you might have some abilities that cause bleed effects as well, uh, but if you want to alternate between utiliz utilizing skill rotations and attacking with your dual daggers with your weapon attacks, um, on your third combo string, you have the ability potentially to land a bleeding blow. But if you have, let's say, the you know gauntlets of, of the you know sneaky rogue or whatever, <laughs> That might say that Very any clear. third, I know, any third combo attack <clears throat> um, effect can occur on your second combo attack as well. Um, so uh, we're playing with a little bit with the idea of how we interact itemization with your weapon skill tree um, and the importance of those types of procs. Awesome. Next question is from Nostra, wanting to get about node XP. For each specific node stage, are all four node types going to provide equivalent node XP gain opportunities to allow for competitive advancement across quest-based XP, gathering XP, and monster kill XP? So the question is, will all node types have the same type of XP sources? Are all four node types going to provide equivalent node XP gain opportunities to allow for yeah. competitive advancement across all of yeah. the a types. Absolutely. Yeah. From a design perspective, we want to be as equitable as possible with those particular node types. Yes. All right. And our next one is from Magic Man wanting to know about quest. Will all three types of quests, narrative, event, and tasks be given by NPCs or is it or is there a specific location for each of those, um, like a notification board in town for tasks and some sort of announcement for events and NPCs for narrative? Uh, I think it's going to be pretty spread out. So some will be on some boards, some won't be on boards, some will be hidden, some will be local. If you move into an area, you'll see it. Some will be gathered from a quest giver. You know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities by which these quests can be almost discovered as well as, you know, known to to go to a specific location for. Um, so uh, having a variety. having a mixture about those, yeah, variety, exactly. George Black wants to know about blocking. Can you give us any development regards, uh, developments regarding active block, hold button down to block since uh, Apocalypse? Um, not yet. <clears throat> That's something that is scheduled for the prototype phase um, that we're going to be discussing internally amongst the designers and the combat team. Um, and then we will likely share with the community once we've nailed down a few approaches and prototype them out. I think you actually mentioned that in the design segment about uh, blocking and yep. parrying and stuff. Yep. Um, Weightlifter445 wants to know about Arena. Can you give us any updates and features in regards to the Arena? Um, you know, the arena system, as we've spoken about before, is going to have ladder systems where people can progress within certain seasons based on their, like, win-loss ratios. Um, you know, uh, the importance of arenas are obviously that players have an opportunity to participate, practice out certain builds from a PvP perspective, um, and can compete with one another uh, within the system. Um, so not a lot has changed on the idea of how arenas are going to be facilitated within Ashes of Creation. We've spoken about this in the past on a, a few occasions, so I would recommend checking out the wiki for arenas. Um, but the intent again is is to to give players an opportunity to to participate against one another in a structured format, unlike a smaller scale for the arena stuff, right? Versus sieging is large scale. Yeah, yeah. right. 
Um, EST or SD wants to know about guilds. Will there be an option to customize guild roles? For example, either creating our own ranks or picking from a list of options, maybe apart from the essential ones such as uh, guild master, an officer, or even allowing these to be renamed? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I think there's going to be functionality present within the administration tools of guilds where you can customize the names of particular ranks that you want to grant specific types of permissions to. You'll have a list of permissions that you can create custom roles um, and you'll be able to check mark those permissions so that that role has access to those things and you can assign them out to your members. Um, additionally, you know, there's something to be said for how guild structure from a membership perspective is organized, right? Having like, you know, night groups and having, you know, specific uh, uh, compartments or departments within the guild structure that has a leader associated with it. That's one of your officers. Like, I think that's a cool uh, concept as well. Um, there's a lot of ideas we have on the administration side and, and how the UI and, and just mechanics of a particular guild structure is facilitated. All right. And our next question is from Neurotoxin about dwarves. Um, how much work went into uh, armoring the model for the formerly Dunir compared to the Nakua? Or was the original Dunir done first in anticipation that it, it could end up being Nakua proportions instead? So basically, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the question, but I'm wondering if I, I think they're meaning like, do we start with one and then kind of alter it to make the other or how do we? Well, each each race has its. So when you think about, you know, modeling um, armor pieces, each race has its own set of geo for individual pieces. Right. So if you're talking about like pauldrons and greaves and breastplates and stuff like that, <clears throat> we don't just take a Dunier breastplate and then deform the breastplate to the Nakua. Um, we can do that, and sometimes we might do that, but generally our approach from a from a um, uh, from an asset production standpoint with character is that each race is getting its custom geo pieces, which then will share thematic components such as color palette, um, attachments, um, design filigree. Um, <clears throat> those types of things will get shared across the geo. Um, but generally, you're going to see unique races with unique geo. All right. And our last one, as I know you need to wrap up here, is from One Piece 33, and they want to know about ships. Will players uh, be able to own their own ships? Uh, will nodes themselves be provided with their own marine ships once they uh, reach a certain level? Basically, like, can they get, a sh get on a ship that's, like, owned by the city, or, like, would they only be able to own their own? Um, generally, ship creation is going to be delegated to the players. Um, so there won't be a lot of non-player-owned ships in the world. There may be some escort-related quest lines that have NPC-driven ships um, <clears throat> that can probably move between nodes. They might be related to the trading system and diplomacy between harbor-driven, you know, harbor-oriented nodes. Um, but for the most part, uh, all ship creation will be delegated to the player. You have to build up a ship or find somebody who has one if you want to get across the seas. That's right. Now, there <laughs> will be NPC ships out on the ocean that are adversaries or monsters, and those will be targets for players to go out and potentially try to raid, destroy, kill, find, treasure find, and all that kind of stuff. All right, and that wraps it up for our Q&A, as I know you have to wrap things up as well. Um, but thank you so much for joining us for our dev update. As a reminder, um, you know, October's coming along, which means that we usually do some fun spoopy events. I'm not going to tease too much, but uh, we normally do a glorious gourd event. So if you're interested in that and you had fun last year, uh, there's even more stuff in store for you coming up this year with some cool rewards. So stay tuned for more information regarding that. Of course, we will have a new dev discussion and some guild gathering uh, information for you all. So give us as much feedback in regards to those. And a reminder that our September cosmetics are going to be swapping over on October 6th. So if you want those, snag them while they're hot. And of course, this video will be available for you right after we're done with the stream over on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash ashes of creation. Or if you'd like to relive it over on our YouTube channel, we will upload it there as well as it will be up on our news post as well. Uh, so we'll keep you informed in all of the places. And of course, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. I don't know, everything, all the things. Find us at ashes of creation in all of the places and keep up with all of the cool stuff that we have for you. We try to post almost every day. Um, so, you know. We have some stuff for you. And I think that's it yeah. from my perspective. Anything else you want to add, Stephen? Just thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you guys for your support. We love all of you. 
and we're excited to share our progress as the months continue and the trek to Alpha 2 is just getting started. Yeah, and hopefully dwarves next month. We'll see. All right, see you guys. Bye, everyone.